our hope is going to be a very innovative class. We'll start with a video that takes you inside the Fairbanks Museum to explore some of our historic exhibits. And then we will turn things over to Bo Harris, our director of collections, who's going to tell you some fascinating stories and facts about the exhibits you have just seen. Um, I just want to welcome everyone again. If you're joining us on our YouTube live stream, if you're joining us in our Zoom meeting, or if you're watching this perhaps later on Kingdom Access Television or one of your local television affiliates, please find all of our online programming at the Fairbanks Museum, available at fairbanksmuseum.org. Um, there's a nice banner at the top of the page that will take you right where you want to go. Before we get started, I just want to point out a few things for those of you in our Zoom meeting. You'll be able to notice that at the bottom of your screen, you have a button for Q&A. That's where we ask that you put your questions for us. We'll do our best when we get to Bo in the live portion of this class to answer any questions you have. You can also ask your questions on there anonymously if you might prefer to do that. To the right of that button, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat button. So of course, you can chat with Bo or myself in there or anybody else who's in the meeting, and you're welcome to do that as well. Um, for those of you joining us on YouTube or perhaps later on Kingdom Access Television, I just want to remind you that you can always send us your questions and in fact, send them to me at dbush at fairbanksmuseum.org. We welcome them either during class or before our next class. So without further ado, I'm just going to share my screen so that I can bring up our video to start class today. And give me a second to make it full screen. And we are going to get started with class right now. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to Inside the Fairbanks at the uh, Fairbanks Museum. My name is Hannah Buckner, and I'm one of the AmeriCorps educators here at the museum. Today, we'll be talking about a few different exhibits that we have, and I'm going to show you the highlights of them and some interesting facts about them. And let's get started. Uh, if you follow me, we will be going to the first exhibit. Welcome to the first exhibit that we'll be seeing today. So these are the flamingos that are on exhibit from the West Indies. There are seven flamingos here and you will note that six out of the seven are pink and one is gray. And that's actually because the gray flamingo is not have reached maturity yet. So it is still quite a youngster and um, until it would have grown up, it would have started eating krill and krill contain this pigment called creatine and creatine is actually what creates the pink color in flamingos um, and there's actually a, a certain way to uh, note um, how you can tell the difference between species of flamingos even though they all look pretty similar and you will note that this orange and black beak is pretty unusual um, so typically you'll be able to tell the difference between them with the beak, but all of these flamingos here are of the same species. Another thing to note is what's in the center of the exhibit. So the mud nests that are in cylindrical shapes are built by the flamingos made out of mud and sometimes straw. And flamingos will use this to lay their eggs. Um, they will sit on top and lay one to two eggs and it'll keep them from being eaten by other animals. Um, they can also just sit and be able to see what's around, and it's also quite close to where they can catch their food. Another thing to note are, is this flamingo who is eating a frog. Um, this is certainly something to uh, note because it's quite unusual, um, but we'll find out a little bit later why that's so unusual. Um, another thing you might note is as we go around, we have some birds over here and there is a spot. You'll also be hearing about that. And no, it is not flamingo poop as much as it looks like it. So this is the exhibit. Thank you for joining me with this exhibit. On to the next one. Welcome to the second exhibit we'll be talking about today. These uh, birds that we are seeing are the birds of paradise as well as ground dwelling pitas. So um, this exhibit is quite interesting because 
all in all, there are about 27 different birds that are seen in this exhibit. Um, you will see that many of these birds of paradise have very long and luscious wings, especially this bird. Um, that's actually quite common for the male birds of birds of paradise. Uh, birds of this species will do very exotic and elaborate dances to woo the females in order to find a mate and um, breed. Um, and they're all quite beautiful, are they not? Some other highlights are these birds that are on the floor. Um, they're called pitas or bower birds, and they live on the ground and they collect feathers and other uh, plants and sticks to build nests like you're seeing here. And that's how they build their nests and interact. You see there's a couple of birds here that are fighting over a worm. <laughs> but you'll actually see that all of these birds have a variation of color and uh, these birds are known to be one of the most beautiful creatures in the world. Um, and they are known for their shimmering colors like this one here. So in our stop today is a Victorian bird tree. Um, so these were quite common in wealthy Victorian homes where uh, collectors in this era would take all of the birds that they've gathered or killed and put them on a tree to show off all of the things that they've caught. So you'll notice that there are many types of birds that are on this tree. Um, we even have a duck down here. Um, looks like we have a falcon. Um, we have lots of smaller birds, but then there is also a turtle. Um, the work is quite beautiful. There is uh, moss that was put on the trees. Um, there's some butterflies that are in and around the tree. Um, some birds have their wings spread out. Some are calling like this one. Um, but overall, it is a very beautifully done exhibit of nature. Thank you for joining me today um, from inside the Fairbanks. And I hope to see you guys soon. Um, now you get to hear some interesting stories about these birds that we've seen today, um, some cool facts about them, some stories that you wouldn't even have thought of that may change how you see the exhibits now. Um, so sit back, relax, and on to you, Bo. So welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us once again. And that concludes the first part of our class. Um, right now, I'm going to turn things over to our Director of Collections, Bo Harris, who is going to tell you a little bit more about what you just saw from inside the Fairbanks. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, thanks for joining us. And uh, I have uh, just a few things, uh, stories and uh, interesting things that might um, you might find interesting. <laughs> uh, so um, about these uh, three exhibits that uh, Hannah uh, took uh, the video of. Um, so we'll, we'll start, we'll go in the same order that she did, uh, starting with the flamingos. Uh, and I'm going to uh, share my screen with you uh, all uh, so I can um, show uh, some close up uh, sections. There we go. Uh, so um, the flamingos uh, diorama, which um, most people call these dioramas. Uh, the technical name for what we have are um, habitat groupings. Um, it's really a technicality, but um, without the backdrop, um, which gives you uh, the broader uh, 
sense of the habitat uh, that in which the animals lived, it's uh, the term for it would be a habitat grouping. And the benefit of this is that you can actually walk all the way around them and see the, uh, the animals and the scene from all four sides, uh, as opposed to the diorama where you can just see it from uh, usually one, one perspective. Um, so uh, William Balch uh, made all of our uh, habitat groupings or dioramas for us, uh, starting in 1891 with a couple of small ones. Uh, the flamingos was his first large scale one, uh, which he uh, did in 1892, uh, using um, uh, skins uh, Franklin Fairbanks had acquired uh, in the 18, 1880s and 1890 um, for the museum. And when uh, Balch came on board, uh, he asked, uh, Franklin asked uh, Balch to um, start with this one uh, for the first larger scale one. Um, and um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, Hannah mentioned that this one flamingo here uh, eating, uh, trying to eat a frog, which um, flamingos actually can't do. They, she mentioned uh, the krill that they do eat, uh, which they use filter out of the water. Um, they're not actually capable of eating something like a, a bullfrog or a, a fish, uh, a fully grown fish anyway. Um, but what Balch was doing was um, going off the scientific data that he had and his knowledge of nature, which was extensive for New England um, animals and um, habitats. Um, but he didn't travel certainly outside of the U.S. at all and um, did never saw a live flamingo that we know of, much less in their native habitat. Uh, that goes for a lot of the other exotic animals that he mounted for the museum. Um, so this is, um, he wanted to show one eating and he did what he could. You know, he thought wading birds eat things like frogs and fish, like uh, great blue herons might that you do see around here, um, but without the knowledge of other areas. Um, and these, a lot of these areas were just becoming known to people in the US and New England. Um, so uh, he also put a little alligator in here, which might probably wouldn't necessarily be seen so close to uh, the flamingos. Um, in their natural habitat. Uh, he was also a, very artistic about some of how he uh, did his dioramas. And uh, remember, you have to remember that when he was making these in the 1890s and early 1900s, there weren't the plastics in, that you have today. So there's no plastic in any of these dioramas or habitat groupings. Um, he made most of the flowers and leaves himself with cloth and wax and uh, very fine wires, uh, which allowed him to position things exactly where he wanted them. Um, but uh, you can see in a lot of the, these habitat groupings that um, he was very artistic about arranging things and making them look visually very nice, um, as well as trying to illustrate the habitats in which they these animals lived. Um, and that was especially true for the more exotic things like the uh, flamingos and the birds of paradise. Um, and uh, so um, one, one thing I did earlier was I, we, we have these old catalogs which list uh, all the birds from the early days of the museum. A lot of these came from Franklin's house, uh, his home where he displayed a lot of these birds, but also it lists things that came in during the early days of early, early decades of the museum. You can see uh, I had this open to the page where the flamingos are listed. Uh, this 182 is the number for the American flamingo, not a particular specimen. So all the flamingos had that number. Um, these came from the Bahamas and uh, William Balch was uh, paid $99 um, in 1892 to uh, create this uh, very nice display for the museum, which has been on display since 1892. In that case, that it was that you can see it in now, um, which is um, 
also equally amazing, I think, um, given the condition that it, the good condition that it's still in. Um, and Hannah mentioned the, uh, what looks like the <laughs> uh, bird droppings in her video. Uh, those are actually uh, part of a little museum secret, uh, behind the scenes secret. Um, they were, that was not part of the original um, thing that Balch made. Uh, that was the result of uh, some uh, museum people, employees during the, in the 18, uh, 1960s, I believe, um, trying to uh, put a layer on top of the case because the top of the case has glass as well. They were trying to diffuse some of the light a bit and they were putting a mixture of beer and Epsom salts on which would dr then dry and diffuse some of the light that was going into the case. And a little bit dripped into the case by accident and um, landed where you saw it and um, appears to be the bird dropping. So they left it there, <laughs> um, even though it's not original. And um, it's a little bit of a funny story from the museum's past. Um, so moving on to the Birds of Paradise um, display that you saw in the video. Um, this was also done uh, by, as all the large uh, dioramas were that you can see at the museum by William Balch. This one was done a couple of years after the Flamingos in 1894. And uh, again, uh, Balch never saw any of these alive uh, or in their native habitats. Um, he, the, well, Franklin uh, got these um, specimens from a variety of sources. Um, and uh, there are uh, a total of 48 birds in this uh, uh, grouping of about 27 different species, including the birds of paradise and the pittas and uh, the bower birds um, that you saw in the video. Um, and Balch, again, never having seen these alive, did a very good job at um, mounting them in this display and having them look natural. And if you go online, you can see a lot of, uh, or some videos of these birds doing their mating dances and um, how they use their feathers to uh, try and attract a mate. And uh, it, you can see that Balch actually got the position of the feathers when they're doing that um, very accurately. He mounted them very accurately. Um, despite never having seen these alive. Um, a few highlights from this are um, starting with these two uh, birds. Uh, this one on the left uh, here is a uh, 12 wired uh, bird of paradise. This smaller one here on the right is a uh, king bird of paradise. These uh, Franklin uh, acquired from a uh, place in London called Edward Gerard's and Sons. Uh, which was started by a man named, obviously, Ed Edward Gerard, who um, got his specimens from a wide variety of sources, including expeditions that traveled um, around the world, um, collecting various specimens, many of which were new to science. And um, so they were um, discovering and describing these new um, birds and mammals and butterflies and uh, all kinds of different animals and plants. Um, and they would um, sell some of them to Gerard's, which who would in turn who would mount some of them himself, and sell them to museums uh, and collectors, but also sell skins to uh, museums that who would then mount them. Um, and uh, here uh, is another page from the old bird catalog. Uh, right here is the listing for the king birds for paradise. Uh, you can see we have a. It listed here a couple of different ones that came in um, in the 1880s and 1890s from, you can't read it too well, but it says EDW for Edward Gerard um, and the amounts that were paid for them. Uh, and here uh, you can see, uh, oops, you can see uh, Balch was paid $171.17 in 1894 uh, for making this um, very exquisite uh, display of these birds of paradise and um, the other birds. Um, so uh, here, uh, this is a picture of one of the rooms at Edward Gerard's with some of the other animals that 
he mounted um, tigers and bears and giraffes and all kinds of different things, not just uh, birds. Uh, um, so uh, the, these, uh, just at this point, I'll mention that these uh, habitat groupings were sort of a, the Wikipedia or the internet of the time. They allowed people from places in like New England to see these things from far off places and that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to see. Um, even today with the travel um, that we're able to do, not right now now with the COVID-19 <laughs> uh, situation going on, but normally uh, people have much greater access to travel these days, but even now most people wouldn't get to see a lot of these animals in their natural habitats. So that was one of the goals of of doing these displays at places like the Fairbanks Museum and the American Museum of Natural History in New York and um, and others. Um, so moving on, uh, these uh, two birds here, um, this one is a uh, magnificent, uh, magnificent bird of paradise and this lower one on the right is a lesser bird of paradise. These two um, were acquired along with a number of other birds from uh, the Philippines area of the world, the Philippines and surrounding areas, uh, from a man named Edwin Mosley, who had gone on an, uh, one of these expeditions that I mentioned earlier, uh, collecting specimens. Um, and uh, he had a, they had a, collected a lot. And this uh, expedition he was on was the Steer Expedition which was organized by Joseph Steer uh, from the University of Michigan. In, and they, it was a two-year expedition, 1887 to 1888, um, to the Philippines area of the world. And they collected mostly birds, but also a lot of insects and mammals. And um, like I mentioned before, they were trying to uh, cover some of the costs of the expedition by selling some of the things they collected um, after the fact. And um, I don't know off the top of my head the total number of birds that we got from him, but uh, it's uh, dozens of birds that came from that expedition um, and came to the museum in the 18, early 1890s. Um, and um, let's see. <clears throat> So we, Mosley had heard about the Fairbanks Museum. He wrote initially to Franklin. We have in our archives um, uh, about 10 letters from Mosley in which he, they, he and Franklin uh, worked out which birds and how much they would be bought for and that sort of thing. Um, and um, another interesting fact is that the Steer Expedition was following in the steps of um, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was one of these um, early naturalists um, who traveled in the same area a few decades earlier in the 1850s and 60s, and um, also collected widely and was one of the first people to, just, to describe some of these birds of paradise and other birds in the, in the area. And um, he actually had a bird named after him, which is this one. It's the um, Standard winged bird of paradise, which is also known as uh, Wallace's standard wing bird of paradise. Um, and the Latin name is Semioptera wallacei. And we have these two in our collections. This is this one with the green on the front is the male, and this um, one on the top left is the female. And um, uh, here, uh, Right here, number one 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 seven six nine, Wallace's standard wing uh, bird of paradise, uh, male and female. We paid eleven dollars and twenty five cents uh, to Edward Gerards for those um, two specimens um, in 1893. So uh, well after Wallace was there um, doing his collecting and discovery, um, and Wallace isn't as well known as people like Darwin, but he also came up independently with the uh, theory of um, evolution and other um, natural history 
um, ideas, um, including um, a lot of ideas about um, the distribution of different animals and the how uh, how animals became distrib distributed as they are, um, especially in the uh, area of the Pacific uh, around the Philippines and Malaysia and um, that part of the world. Um, so um, moving on to this last uh, display that Hannah um, talked about. Um, this is uh, one of the largest, it's, it is the largest bird, uh, bird tree that we have here at the museum. Um, has uh, 43 spe uh, specimens in it of 30 different species of bird um, with, and it also includes uh, down here that Hannah showed you the turtle, um, which is a little more unusual for bird trees. Um, most of the bird trees we have are just birds. Um, and most don't have the variety of birds that you see in this one. Um, as, and again, as Hannah mentioned, uh, it was all, usually the wealthy collectors of, um, with their cabinets of curiosity in the Victorian era who had uh, this type of display in their home um, with uh, the, in their natural history displays. And they were very much uh, I, um, reflected their interests, but were also, uh, excuse me, um, status symbols. Um, so something like this would have been um, shown a lot of um, wealth and status. Um, and uh, one interesting thing about this bird tree is there's a pair, there are two uh, passenger pigeons. Uh, this one, uh, which you can see very easily down near the bottom, is the male. Uh, I wasn't able to get a good image of the female, which is higher up, but also near the back. Um, so there's a lot of shadows around the female. Um, but um, the, these are, uh, one of the interesting thing about that, that why these are um, included is that when these were collected in the 1860s, probably when that's our best guess as to when this bird tree was made, these were still fairly common, uh, these pigeons. Um, they, in, around 1800, they numbered in the billions and there were flocks of millions of them flying around the, uh, the United States and Canada. And by the late 1800s, there were not very many of them at all left, uh, the numbering in the thousands probably. And by 1914, um, the last one died in, in the zoo and they are now extinct. Um, so um, having these two in this bird tree is actually um, pretty amazing that we have them. Um, and what's more amazing is that at the museum, we have a total of five passenger pigeon mounts and um, four of which are on display, two in this bird tree. And then there's a pair that are mounted together um, in the endangered species exhibit on the main floor of the museum. Um, so, uh, yeah, and finally, the, uh, these bird trees were an older dis display type uh, that was, were, were very popular, as Hannah mentioned, in the Victorian era um, and stemmed from the Cabinet of Curiosities type uh, collections and displays. Um, and then in the 18, starting in the late 1880s and 1890s, um, the habitat groupings and dioramas started to be developed and come into um, common use in museums out of a desire to uh, show birds, not just the specimens of birds and different types, but uh, take people out into nature and a little bit and display them more in their nat um, native habitats and uh, get that aspect into the museums and displays as well. Um, and then it went from there well into the um, the diorama type displays were developed further and went well into the uh, 20th century before um, other types of displays were uh, developed. So uh, thanks for joining us and I hope you found this uh, as interesting as I find it. <laughs>
Yeah, and I just will reiterate, Bo, and say thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. This has been a, a trip inside the Fairbanks Museum. Um, and we're excited that everybody was able to make it with us for both parts of our class today. And we'll be continuing this series on Fridays at 1 p.m. So stay tuned for our next segment on this topic. And thank you again to Bo Harris and to Hannah Buckner for all of their hard work. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day.